Welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Today on the show, we're going to talk a little about the crops we've been talking about for several years now 2,4-D and dicamba tolerant crops. Are they going to make it out for 2016? We'll give you the answer or at least give you our speculation on today's show. Well, I don't care what crop you plant, you still have to fertilize that crop and feed it if you want to be successful. We'll talk about a couple of the most popular ways that are going on in our country strip till fertilization and broadcast fertilization. We've got a weed of the week that we've seen quite a bit of already this morning, but first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. As it gets late in the season, one of the things you have to take a look at if you're going to spray any pesticide is the pre-harvest label. We'll talk about what exactly that is and why it's so important on today's show. Well, we ran into this in soybeans with herbicides. This year, again, we had a lot of issues with pigweed across the country, and guys were spraying maybe Flexstar in some areas of the country. Well, that runs out because of a 10-month rotational restriction to corn for a lot of guys back in June or maybe the 1st of July. Then you look at your next option and while that may have a 45 day pre-harvest interval so you got a little bit of a window others have an interval where it's a certain growth stage in the crop maybe it's r2 or r4 in soybeans no matter which product you're using for weed control insect control whatnot you've got to look at how much time you need in that pre-harvest interval we ran into a problem this year with some soybean seed that came from south america it was a brand new variety it was a liberty link variety and they had done a pre-harvest burn down or pre-harvest desiccation with Roundup. They wanted to kill the plants because the stalks were still green so they would be able to harvest it quicker. And what happened is the weather turned and all of a sudden they sprayed the Roundup and a couple days later, wow, those beans look like they're ready to go. And so the guys pulled the trigger, harvested the beans. Anyway, when those beans came back up, now they still had some Roundup residual in the seed itself. And we had some issues with the seed in the spring, planting it in the soil. That was a big deal. If we would have just followed that pre-harvest interval and it waited at least seven days before we harvested the beans, it would have been enough time for the plant to work that Roundup through. The Roundup would have been gone and the seed would have been perfect. Now that's a really an extreme example, but the same thing happens when we're thinking about crops that we're raising for food, we want to make sure whatever pesticide we've used has worked its way through that plant system so it's no longer going to be in that seed that's going to be consumed by humans or by animals. A pre-harvest interval is listed on the label of most pesticides and all it basically means is how many days do you need to spray before harvest. So it might be seven days, it might be 45 days, it might even be 120 days. But the point is as a farmer you have to take a look at hey when am I going to harvest and obviously we don't know exactly what the weather is going to bring us. So if it's 60 days, I say, I don't know if it's exactly 60 days. It might be 70 days, it might be 80 days, or it might be 60 days depending on the weather. So as a farmer, we're just making an educated guess as to when the last date is we can spray. But then once we say, hey, I'm spraying today, now I've got to look at, I can't go into that field again to do harvest until 60 days later, or 45 days later, whatever it is. So sometimes we have some late season problems in our crops, like bugs, for example. We're looking at soybeans. Sometimes we have to spray pretty close to harvest. Well, there might be one insecticide that has a 28 day pre-harvest interval and another has a seven day pre-harvest interval and both will work on the insect. If I'm up against it and I say, ooh, I might be able to harvest in 25 days, well, then that excludes the 28 day pre-harvest interval product and I'll just pick the product that has the seven day pre-harvest. So how do you set these pre-harvest intervals? That's what many people will ask. Well, how do they know for sure that it's safe 30 days ahead? There's exhaustive testing that the companies will do in conjunction with the government. The government will have some strict requirements as we need this much testing done and then we'll see what the levels are in the plants and make sure that it's completely worked through the system before we're going to approve it. So you'll see a lot of variance in the different products as Brian was mentioning. One may be seven day pre-harvest. In fact, there are some bug sprays that you can use in vegetable crops with a one day pre-harvest interval. You may spray on a tomato to kill a certain bug that's damaging the tomato and you may be able to harvest one day later. It all depends on what kind of testing has been done and if the government has proven that, you know what? Yeah, that is safe to put on one day before 
then it's going to get approved. If they find, no, we need at least 30 days to get that residue away, then that's what they're going to do as well. Yeah, but here's the thing. You might see a pre-harvest interval of 60 days, for example. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's dangerous to spray within seven days of harvest. It just means it's not labeled, it's not approved. And one of the reasons why could be the company just didn't choose to spend the millions of dollars to prove it to the government that, hey, this actually is safe because they said, you know, everybody's gonna spray early anyway. So since nobody's gonna spray close to harvest, why do we need to go through all that testing and spend all those millions of dollars? So you do see some of that, but when you see the pre-harvest label, there's two things you need to understand. As long as you're spraying and giving it more time than that, so if it's seven days and you spray 10 days out, hey, you're perfectly safe, okay? So the government's proven it's safe, that's number one. And then number two, the label is the law. So if it says seven days, you gotta make sure you're giving that seven days before you harvest. Well, one thing you may be out there spraying for is our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? Your time is valuable. That's why you need a Hagee STS application system. Hagi STS products are designed for precision and efficiency, allowing you to make applications all season long with just one machine. Contact your Hagi rep today. When we use agriculture liquid, uh, we'll usually end up with 2.7 to 3 pounds a gain per animal a day. We had a hundred head out on a pasture this last fall that gained at 2.7. You know, they made about 450 bucks. We usually get about a 10 day start. It's ready 10 days early. And we're grazing and they're waiting and we're gaining. I've been involved in developing new technologies in agriculture for over three decades. The changing times demanded that we develop new and better equipment. Dry powder applications on seed can only be highly successful if they can be easily, effectively, and accurately applied to the target. That's where our company, Changing Times, and CT applicators come into the picture. The innovative CT applicators are designed to give you the most accurate application of products such as talc, soybean inoculants, or other dry products. Remember, CT applicators for the changing times. Dirty work pays. That is if your dirty work includes a Soil Max Gold Digger tile plow. Soil Max tile plows feature zero deflection technology. With the only tile plow factory paired with Ag Leaders and Teleslope control system, you eliminate the need for grade calculations and lasers. So make your next investment in a Soil Max Gold Digger. Better yield, longer planning and harvest windows, better water management is all yours with Soil Max. Visit SoilMax.com. With the success of the Case IH Tiger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us. But only Case IH offers a five axle design to give you a smoother ride, more power to the ground, with less berming and compaction. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, we'd be blushing. Regalia RX Biofungicide activates a plant's natural defense system, limiting the effects of disease and improving overall plant health. Regalia RX complements your fungicide program to optimize yield and strengthen return on investment. Ask your retailer for Regalia RX today. One of the things Darren and I get a lot of questions about each year is comparing banding versus broadcasting fertilizer. Hey, can I use less fertilizer if I band? Because that's what universities are telling me, soils labs are telling me. Can I actually do that? We've gotten a chance to travel and speak around the world in different farming regions. And many people that I talk to in other countries say, wait a minute, you guys are raising the biggest crops yet you're putting your fertilizer on in the most inefficient way. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, aren't you planting your row crops generally on 20 to 30 inch row space? And I said, yeah, we are. They said, well, why on earth would you broadcast and put fertilizer everywhere when you only have a plant every 20 or 30 inches? Why wouldn't you just put the fertilizer right where you need it? Because you're spending more money than what you would need to to fertilize for that crop. Okay, so after looking at all these university studies and getting all these questions for many years, Darren and I started this project. This goes back about 13 years ago, and we decided, you know what, let's find out on a big scale if what they're saying is true. Now, we realize that 
things like nitrogen and sulfur, they're going to move in soil. So yeah, you might be able to cut back 5 or 10% by banding, but that's about it. And even that, I sometimes question. But with phosphorus and potassium and zinc, some of these types of fertilizers that do not move in the soil or do not move hardly at all, that's where it appears, and from what universities and soils labs have said, hey, we can actually get by with less fertilizer when we band compared to broadcast. So anyway, what we did is we took roughly 500 acres and we did nothing but band for about 11 years. And we took roughly 500 acres and did nothing but broadcast for about 11 years. But when we broadcast, we put on 50% more P and K for 11 years in a row. Seriously. So some of these fields, you would say, oh my goodness, wow, you spent a lot more money. Yeah, we did. We did spend a lot more money and our soil tests went up. But here's the whole thing. We didn't gain really hardly anything in terms of yield. Now, eventually, I hope that we do. But I mean, I've already got a lot of gray hair. I'm going to have a ridiculous amount of gray hair before that seems to pay off just in my guesstimation, because it was several hundred dollars more per acre that we invested in total to do this study on all those broadcast acres. And yeah, so our soil test is a lot better. The whole thing is we didn't necessarily get everything balanced out. We didn't do everything else in the field, maybe to take advantage of all that fertilizer. Maybe we will someday. Maybe we'll figure that out. But all I'm trying to say is, hey, we've proven on our farm, yes, the universities are correct when they say you can use about a third less P and K when you ban compared to broadcast. But the way we like to phrase it is, look, you can take whatever you've got in the band, you're going to need roughly 50% more P and K in a broadcast. Well, here's one thing that we've also noticed is drought tolerance. When we've got fertility placed deep below the soil, we're talking about eight inches deep, and we plant our crop right over the top of that, when roots grow down, they're going to grow right through that fertility zone and thrive. We've got deeper root systems, we've got more well-developed root systems, and when we run into dry conditions later in the season, plants need moisture to bring in nutrients. If you've got all your nutrients placed in the top couple inches of soil, well, that's where it's going to dry out first. When we're about eight inches down with our fertility applications, there's still some moisture down there and plants are able to bring those nutrients in. And we've seen more drought tolerance when we apply fertilizer in a deep band versus broadcasting on the surface. One of the reasons I believe that we're getting much more out of that band than the broadcast is we started by just banding and banding with the planter, but very quickly we switched over to the deep banding. So we're still banding, but it was now in a strip till and deep banding. And I think that's why we're getting just as much yield out of that as broadcasting so much more P and K because we've got our fertility levels built up in that eight to 10 inch range much greater, or really I should say six to 10 inch range. We're trying to put that fertilizer down at eight to 10 inches, but you know how it is. There's going to be a little bit that's at six, a uh, little bit at seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way in there. But all I can tell you is, yeah, our top six inches, we're in great shape on the broadcast. We're in okay shape on the strip till. But you get down to the next six inches, man, we're in fantastic shape on the strip till. Whereas on the broadcast fields, we have very little fertilizer in the six to 12 inch range. And this really comes into play with the non-mobile nutrients. And Brian talked about things like nitrogen and sulfur that can move around in the soil. I don't really like to place those deep. I want to place things like phosphorus, potassium, and the micronutrients down deeper in the soil. That way, instead of relying on maybe decades worth of rain to try and move those down in the soil, we're going to move them down in one shot and just place them down low where we want them to begin with. The other big benefit of this is when we think about any kind of nutrients that move off the field. Like let's say we get a really heavy rain and it washes a little bit of topsoil with it. If you've got all your fertility right on the soil surface, you're going to move most of your fertility away if you have any erosion at all. When we're placing it down deep in the soil, nutrients like phosphorus, for example, that we're very concerned about, we've protected that from erosion by placing it deep. We don't have to worry about that. It's a really nice thing. So the reason why we're bringing this up today is a lot of people late in the summer go to farm shows, field days, and they start thinking, you know, maybe I could do my fertility in a different way. If there's something you wanted to try this year, our suggestion would be think about maybe doing some strip till, but not just strip till. Deep place your fertilizer, band it, and then in terms of the fertilizer recommendation, hey, you got to look at 200 bushel corn removes X number of nutrients. Don't put on less than that, okay? We're not saying cut if you've already been down at the bottom end of where you should have been. What we're saying is look at what that crop's going to remove, put that on in a band. Now if you want a comparison, put on 50% more P and K in a broadcast, that'll get you fairly close. Remember, when you're banding, you have less tie-up of that fertility in the soil 
and it's better placed so chances are you've got that root system that can find that fertilizer a lot better and those are the main reasons why fertilizer in a band is much more efficient than fertilizer in broadcast. Well, the other thing I like about banding the fertilizer is you can keep it away from weeds like our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed coming up later in the show. Wake up, breakfast is served. Your roots crave pee. Most of your applied pee gets tied up in the soil, a natural phenomenon known as phosphorus fixation. Fix the problem with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Avail makes more pee available to your roots, here, here, and here. Increasing pee availability can lead to increased pee uptake in the plant. That's more pee, more pee, and more pee. More phosphorus for your crop can mean more results in your bin. An average of 9.6 bushels per acre of corn. Breakfast is served. Supercharge your pee with Avail. It's a humble idea. Use a biological process to turn a plant into a power source. From that idea came the first Poet Refinery. One biorefinery in one town turned into 27 facilities in 27 towns, creating new local jobs, producing hundreds of millions of gallons of ethanol, and providing renewable products around the world. Suddenly, that one little idea seems a whole lot bigger. See the world differently with Poet. Being a farmer means securing your land and livelihood for the future. Harvest Solutions from Capello USA have the grit to get you there. Our product lines for corn, sunflowers, and forage are designed for efficiency and longevity, preventing harvest loss while minimizing maintenance and downtime. To do everything you can to advance your farmland to the next generation, call us at 855-CAPELLO or visit us at capellousa.com. Capello USA, Italian craftsmanship, American grit. A farmer's attention to detail is what makes the difference. You take the time for service management because you know how vital it is to your operation. You service your field like everything else because soil sampling makes all the difference and gets the results you want. Download the app Soil Test Pro and start grit sampling today. Keep your farm growing strong. The more you test, the more you know. Precision in grain moisture management can save you thousands in spoilage and elevator docks. The AgriDrive Bullseye Controller monitors temperature and grain moisture and is available for all dryer makes and models. Plus, our AD Link feature gives you 24 7 remote monitoring and allows you to control your dryer wherever you are. Call us today for more information. Dry load store, one eight five five Acre Drive. One of the most popular questions we've gotten over the last few years is, hey, when are these new soybean traits gonna come to market? Well, I'd love to be able to tell you, oh, we know for sure this one's gonna come out in 2016 and that one's gonna come out in 2018, but guess what? We have no idea. We really don't know if any of them will ever make it out, but we believe that many of them are close. So in the next couple of years, you're gonna see several new soybean traits. We wanna talk about those today because we have many of these in our operation this year. Well. All right, the United States is approving new traits. There is a predictable process. They know exactly what they need to find out if traits are safe and if they should be approved. However, in other countries, that system may or may not be quite as predictable. And we need approval in the European Union. We need approval in China and other countries before farmers are going to be able to plant these across our country, even if our countries approve them. On our farm right now, we've got five different soybean traits. Uh, some of them have been approved already in our country, others have not. Others are still in a restricted state. Experimental but, use permit. Yeah, we're looking at a lot of these different traits because we want to find out, all right, which ones are actually working, which ones are helpful to us, and which ones could make you some money. Okay, two that you've heard a lot about are the Enlist trait and that Dicamba trait, the Roundup Ready to Extend soybeans. So yeah, we're really excited about both of those because it's products we've used for many years in other crops. 2,4-D you've, yeah, you've used in your pastures and Dicamba, Clarity, for example, you've used in your corn. We know those products will kill most of the Roundup resistant weeds that are out there. And don't think that, oh, this is the silver bullet and it's the answer to everything and all my prayers and dreams, it, this is the best thing ever. Um, there are already weeds that are resistant or at least tolerant to both 2,4-D and dicamba. These are nice tools. It'll be great to put your pre down, throw Roundup post, and along with that, 
throw some 2,4-D or dicamba, but we just don't know for sure if these are going to be out. There was a lot of talk that, hey, 2016 is the year they're definitely going to be out, but now here as it stands today, we would say at the earliest, we believe December is the time at the earliest, but really, quite frankly, it might be 2017 for both of those traits. Darren, why don't you talk about those other traits that we've got on our farm? Well, there's a number of other ones that we're looking at as well, like Balance GT soybeans, for example, where you can put Balance herbicide down pre-emerge and then come back with Roundup post-emerge. There's another HPPD tolerant trait where you can spray the HPPDs post. Things like Callisto or Lotus, for example, that chemistry could be used post-emerge. We're also looking at a triple stack where we've got balance that we could apply pre, then either Roundup or Liberty post-emerge. That's pretty cool. There's new traits like the E3 trait where it's the 2,4-D tolerant trait plus Roundup tolerance plus Liberty tolerance. Well, all I know is it's going to be a lot better having more tools, having more herbicide options. We don't know for sure when any of these things are going to come out or if they're going to come out, but there is a lot of promise. We're very excited about it and hopefully we'll see these tools in the near future. Well, new herbicide tools are always fun to use, especially if you have weeds like our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how how to stop it coming up next. The Weed of the Week is sponsored by the Enlist Weed Control System from Dow AgroSciences, a new herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate. Farming isn't just in the land, it's in you. Take control of weeds like never before. Enlist builds on the Roundup Ready system combining proven control of a new 2,4-D and glyphosate in Enlist Dual Herbicide. Protect what matters without changing the way you farm. Talk to your seed or crop protection supplier today. is catchweed bed straw. Now, this has an interesting name and where it comes from is years ago, it was actually used as filling in mattresses because it sticks together. It kind of clings to you. So if you're walking past it, for example, it's gonna attach to your clothing. Well, because it that sticks to each- That doesn't sound very good in well, your bed. No, but it, be, because it sticks to each other. Yeah, you've got a mattress uh, around this. But anyway, the whole point is it doesn't compact down like a lot of other plants would. So it was used as bed filling. As with many plants, there are some herbal remedies that this plant was used for, like eczema, for example. Yeah, eczema, psoriasis. So it's got some herbal benefits, but you know what? On the farm, if it's in your crop, it's a weed and we've got to get it under control. Well, if it's in the pasture or if it's in a cereal crop, there are a number of different options. For years, 2,4-D had been the best option, but it is kind of damaging for many cereal crops. So we look for other options like husky and wheat, AIM is a nice product in a burn down that doesn't have residual, so it's not going to carry over into any crop that you may be planting. When we're thinking about in grass or in lawns, quinclorac or drive would be a good option to use. In sorghum, we could use paramount. So there are a number of different herbicides that are pretty active on catchweed bed straw. Where we do usually see it, and the reason why we're standing right by a tree grove right now is that's commonly where you're going to find that catchweed bed straw, where it's kind of open and exposed on the edges of that shelter belt. So there, that's where we're typically using 2,4-D, but we like to spray late in the fall after the leaves drop and early in the spring. Spray again. A lot of times we look at, hey, I sprayed already in the fall. I don't see anything in the early spring, so I'm just not going to spray. And then you end up with a bunch of catchweed bed straw. So even if you don't see it early in the spring, spray again, because once those leaves get on the trees, you really don't want to spray 2,4-D out in your grove. This is one of those weeds we get asked about a lot. Hey, what is this weed with a square stem that's very sticky, almost like Velcro, it'll stick to your clothes. The weed of the week is catchweed bed straw. Well, that's all the time we have for today's weed, but stay tuned. Iron Talk is coming up next. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. The AFS Connect Farm Management System from Case IH connects you and only you to the information you need most from your equipment from anywhere at any time. AFS Connect only from Case IH.
More attention is being placed on the safety of insecticide applications around bees than ever before. In fact, there are even some herbicides and fungicides that could impact bees as well. Tips to reduce the impact of spray applications around bees is the topic of today's Iron Talk. First of all, anytime you're going to be spraying an insecticide, you should give some notice to area beekeepers. There are online registries of bee colonies you can consult to see if there are bees in your area. Next, you can target times when bees aren't going to be in your fields at all. Spraying late in the day or when the weather's a little cooler can both be opportunities to do your job when bees aren't very active. Spraying before your crop is flowering is generally a best agronomic practice, but it's also a time where your bees aren't in the fields. Hitting the weeds before they flower too ensures they won't go to seed and that pollinators aren't already tending to them. Another good practice is to avoid spraying when there is a dew or shortly before the dew comes on at night. Not only does this potentially lead to spray running off the leaf, it also increases your rain fast time substantially and it leaves the insecticide on the leaves longer, resulting in more time where that application could be dangerous for nearby bees and pollinators. Finally, use labeled rates so the long-term impacts in fields are known. To reduce problems related to drift, use larger spray droplets, lower spray pressure, and keep spray booms as close to the crop as you can while still maintaining the optimum spray pattern. Many of these tips are simply good practices for spraying anything. When it comes to protecting off-target bees and pollinators, they quickly become essential practices. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. What if instead of running test plots on 10 acres, you could test on 10,000? With Farmers Business Network, the world becomes your plot trial. FBN is the independent farmer-to-farmer -farmer agronomic network. FBN connects real data from tens of thousands of fields and provides you trusted analysis on hundreds of seeds, practices, and field performance to maximize your profits. Find out how your field seeds and practices compare today by joining the FBN community at FarmersBusinessNetwork.com. Just $500 per year for unlimited acres. Looking to maximize yield? Quick Roots from Monsanto BioEgg is a microbial seed inoculant that allows the plant root to explore a greater volume of soil. The key to higher yields. Quick Roots continues to generate yield response on corn, soybeans, wheat, and more, and is applied to the seed so the live microorganisms go right to work enhancing seedling vigor, increasing the uptake of certain nutrients including NPK, and expanding root volume. Maximize yield on your farm this season. Get Quick Roots today. We know that the future is liquid. That's how Agroculture Liquid Fertilizer creates the highest quality products on the market. Because we're committed to finding the best raw materials at the best price possible and getting them from us to you in the most sustainable, responsible ways possible. Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers, helping you grow the future. For lower cost, higher production, Mandaco Agri leads with versatility unmatched. Twister is the vertical tillage unit for no-till as well as conventional tillage. Twister's ease of maintenance is forgiving in rocks and has contour conformity equaling zero downtime. Our hydraulically adjusted coulter angles make residue management easier, less costly, spring or fall. The Mandaco Twister vertical tillage unit is the new leader. See your Mandaco Agri dealer. Visit northcountrymarketing.biz or call. Wake up, breakfast is served. Your roots crave pee. Most of your applied pee gets tied up in the soil, a natural phenomenon known as phosphorus fixation. Fix the problem with a veil phosphorus fertilizer enhancer. A veil makes more pee available to your roots. Here, here, and here. Increasing pee availability can lead to increased pee uptake in the plant. That's more pee, more pee, and more pee. More phosphorus for your crop can be more results in your bin. An average of 9.6 bushels per acre of corn. Breakfast is served. Supercharge your pee with a veil. Take a look inside any rotary combine and you'll find single rotor technology. Technology Case IH introduced over 35 years ago with the Axial Flow Combine. But unless it gives you more bells and whistles with fewer belts and chains, more power using less fuel, it's not an Axial Flow. Because while the heart of every rotary combine beats red, only Case IH gives you the power to do more. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. On your farm, you need speed and year-round effectiveness in your tillage program. The Quick Till from Norwood Sales allows you to move quickly through your fields, maximizing time and improving yield. Constructed of heavy-duty materials, the Quick Till is ideal for both spring and fall applications, from preparing a healthy seed bed early in the season to breaking up corn residue after harvest. For more information about how a quick till can improve fields on your farm, call Norwood Sales today.
That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune into the Ag PhD radio show. You'll find us at 2 p.m. Central each weekday on Sirius XM Channel 147. Don't miss the next Ag PhD television program, but we'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. American ethanol is made primarily from corn. Did you realize that the type of corn used for ethanol and livestock feed is much different than the sweet corn on your dinner table? For more information, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.